Hello, everyone. So uh, I am extremely excited to be uh, in this panel with these indus uh, fantastic industry experts. Um, uh, we're going to start by introducing ourselves. Um, uh, let me introduce myself first. So I'm Donatella Calegaris. I'm a co-managing partner of Flashpoint Venture Debt. Flashpoint is an international um, uh, fund manager um, f uh, managing six funds, uh, uh, three venture capital funds, one venture debt and one secondary. We focus uh, on uh, backing uh, attractive companies uh, using our C uh, USP angle and fit on the ground, but we are investing in companies everywhere in Europe and, uh, uh, and Israel. And uh, I'm going to just now pass on the word to uh, introduce my fantastic panel. So shall we start with Simon first? Yeah, thanks, Donatella. Yeah, I'm uh, Simon Bumphrey. I'm head of technology and life sciences at HSBC Innovation Banking. Um, what that focuses on, that's across the UK and Europe, and that's really focused on those particular innovation sectors from very much the startup through the venture capital and, and high growth phase, and then through to the more mature end of the market. So those businesses that are either listed or they're acquired by private equity. Um, we, we break down our business, not only on the life stages, but we break them down into sectors as well. So we have sec subsectors that are involved in fintech, consumer, enterprise software, and also uh, sustainability, and what we call frontier tech, which is really around, I guess, AI and robotics. And we'll probably touch a bit on that as we kind of go through the discussion. Thanks, Simon. Uh, Derek Piemontel here, growth investor with PSG Equity. Uh, we're a B2B software focused uh, fund, pretty much offices in the US and as well as London, Paris, and Madrid. Um, we typically are pretty horizontal within B2B software. Um, investing really in businesses that are in or around 10 million of ARR, so really at that kind of um, later stage in, in the growth phase, um, investing anywhere between 20 million up to 150 million euros um, across, again, different verticals within B2B software, no particular focus. We've invested in anything from CRM for SMEs to ERP for funeral homes to cybersecurity to core HR, so um, looking forward to the discussion. Thanks for being here. Okay, thank you very much, Simon and Derek. Um, uh, let's start with Simon. So what uh, would you advise uh, f uh, founders to uh, start, SaaS founders to start uh, looking and thinking when they, uh, they're about to approach their fundraising uh, journey? Yeah, I'm, uh, I probably spend 50% of my time talking with investors and those businesses that want to lend and have debt alongside those businesses. Um, I think one of the, the big topics that's clearly coming through is that you know, we are moving in, or we're currently in, and certainly moving towards a more normalized market, however you describe normalized in, in today's kind of what's going on. Um, I think for me, investors are certainly spending more time in terms of diligence. So they're, they're spending time with you as founders in terms of your characters, about what your, your business is, is doing. So I think it's very important for founders to probably just take a step back and work out who you want to do business with in terms of the, the investors. What subsectors do these investors focus on? Um, are they going to be with you on that long-term journey? Have they got additional funds to take you forward as your, as your business grows? Um, I, th I think also, if I, when I'm speaking to these investors, it's, 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 it's looking forward. It's about, try to explain what your customer proposition is. So what are you developing and how relevant is it to the end consumer? I think any business with good management teams and a relevant product will raise money in this current climate. So that's really key to, for, to, for investors to understand what your product is. I think also looking at those unit economics, the underlying um, capital efficiency, and there's been a lot of talk, I'm, I'm sure you've heard over the last couple of days, around balancing growth versus outlining your views of long-term profitability for businesses. And I think that's absolutely key as we go forward into this next phase or evolution of investing. Um, and I'm sure Derek will touch on some of the metrics as well. Yeah, I think um, I would like to actually um, uh, take what you just said, Simon, to dive into uh, deeper 
into uh, what founders should, should be looking and should be doing in these uh, um, different uh, macro environments that we are, uh, uh, we are in. So, um, Derek, um, what, uh, uh, what would you advise the founders uh, to focus on uh, key metrics uh, when they start the fundraising? And before you start, I think uh, as we are both on, uh, uh, we are, you're on the equity side, I'm on the, me and Simon are on the debt side. I have the, more, the feeling more and more that we are getting aligned in how we see the metrics and how we expect the founders to look at the, at the metrics, uh, um, even though we provide different asset classes. And the floor to you, because I know you're going to deep dive. Yeah, for sure. I think. <laughs> To no shock to anybody, I think you know, software KPIs that probably a lot of you in this room track become more and more important. They've always been important, but I think are starting to be looked at um, very diligently. And that comes down to, to the basics of looking at what's your gross retention, what's your, what's your net retention, both from a dollar perspective and a logo perspective. Um, if you happen to be selling to different customer types, right? Enterprise, SMBs, how does that differ, right? Knowing exactly where you have a better sales efficiency, tracking exactly where you're spending every dollar from a sales and marketing perspective, and what's the payback on that, right? Um, coming up and knowing exactly what your LTV to CAC is, um, and if you're going after the enterprise, what that looks like. If you're going after the SMB, what does that look like, right? How long does it take you to get uh, a full payback on, on a customer becomes more and more important. I think the other thing I would highlight is and maybe this doesn't fall necessarily under a, a metric per se, but as you think about fundraising and thinking about the quantum you want to fundraise, it's where it's going to be the use of those proceeds, right? Knowing exactly where you're going to spend that money, it's no longer, hey, I want to raise 20 million and this is what's up for grabs and, and can, can investors meet it? I think we are more and more focused on knowing exactly where that primary capital is going to be used and that whether that's hey, I got some tech I'd like to develop so I could cross-sell to my customers, and that's what I think the revenue potential is. That's great. What's that amount to? If it's sales and marketing, if it's you know, opening new markets, is it continuing to expand and spend in your existing markets? What are the different channels you're going to use to spend that money? I think it's really diving into the details um, and knowing exactly where, where and how you're going to spend that money. Um, and, and knowing exactly the runway that that's going to give you. Um, and, and certainly being able, to the extent possible, showing what you think that will ultimately be on, on, on the flip side. Okay, so I, I think uh, what I take from what you said is uh, um, one very important thing, which is focus, right? So focus on, uh, on your key metrics, your unit economics, and, and also what's happening around you, because uh, I believe that all three of us would agree that in the past we were able, oh, they, fundraiser and us, we were able to uh, forecast uh, when the company would raise because there was so much availability of, uh, of capital. So it would be really nice to, uh, to know what Simon uh, thinks about uh, what he would tell the founders about the fundraising environment, what to look for, what, uh, what has changed. Yeah. Um, and in terms of timing, what, what's happened? So how predictable or not predictable that is? Yeah. I am. Um, I'm personally really, really positive about the outlook. Um, I, I was on a, another stage here last year, and I was talking about you know the the level of cash that's in the market, and uh, I predicted we would see an uptick in Q4 this year, and, and I got that wrong. Um, we started seeing a gradual uplift, but the uptick that I thought was going to happen hasn't quite happened at the level. Um, I think that's going to move forward into probably kind of Q2, Q3, Q4 next year. But why am, I, why am I so positive about it? I mean, obviously, there's just so much cash out there in the ecosystem. There's a lot of cash waiting to be deployed. Um, on, on top of that, you've got investors that want to deploy. They have this cash, and I'm sure Derek would love to look at a multitude of deals and start deploying the cash that's available to him. And then thirdly, for me anyway, you, you've got these SaaS businesses that have proved so resilient 
even through the downturn, even through the downturn, there's continued to be investment into SaaS businesses far in excess of any other particular sector. So the, the business model that SaaS has is, enthu is an enthusiastic one for, for all the investors. So I you know, remain um, you know, particularly, particularly positive about the outlook going forward. I'm so pleased to hear that. Uh, and, and, with, and, and with some debt alongside it, of course. Yeah, we're supposed to be the, <laughs> the boring investors <laughs> looking at everything, everything that can go wrong and all of that. Okay, um, uh, I think now it would be time to uh, focus uh, on another magic word, uh, extremely important during the current times. And I would address the question to Derek. Uh, how would you advise these uh, fantastic founders that are trying to raise their capital and get to the next uh, value creation milestone to approach uh, the magic word, profitability? Yeah, um, profitability is certainly super important. Um, and I think it's not to be confused necessarily with, I think you could still be a loss-making business, uh, but still have profitable growth, right? And I think, Sounds like something we used to talk about a long time ago that got lost somewhat in the strong market in 2021. Coming back to that rule of 40, right? I think um, being able to grow at a profitable level is super important. Um, and we could, if you couple that with then being able to go out to fundraise and coming back on the topic, if you're thinking about going to fundraise, if you're going to be loss making for the rest of 24, being able to definitely know when you're going to hit and, and show that path to profitability, right? So it's not necessarily, hey, the expectation is you're going to raise capital, you're going to become profitable. If the growth is there, I think most investors could get comfortable with it. If there's a market opportunity, um, there's an acquisition that you've always wanted to go do that you know is available that's in the market and you don't necessarily have the capital for it, but hey, there's a ton of upside there and there's some cost synergies to go have to be had, had, then that is also okay. And I think investors could get comfortable with it, but certainly being able to show when you're going to get to that and when you're going to be able to flip to being either break even or profitable is something that is a must have, I think, in, in this market environment. I think gone are the days of being able to raise capital uh, where an investor does limited due diligence and does a deal in two weeks and you know, the money's in your bank account. Um, I think that is certainly something we haven't seen in a long time. Um, but, yeah, and, and I strongly don't think we'll see it come again, right? So I think that's where, uh, where, where most people are headed towards. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Um, I mean, there's been a big shift in mindset around this kind of growth versus profitability. And probably over the last two or three years, it was very much, or probably four years, probably very much growth focused, um, you know, just grow that top line. And we shouldn't forget that because it's extremely, extremely important to grow the top line. But there has to be some control over those underlying metrics that we, t we talked about. Um, and also growth can be in fits and starts because a company may go through a growth phase. It may go to a different geography where you see, uh, you might go into uh, the US, for example, where you invest in the marketing and you, and you grow that top line. And therefore, you might have a period where those unit economics might just be slightly out of kilter. Mm -hmm. But as long as there's a plan and a journey and that's explained to the investors, then that's fine because you know, the company does need growth. But I, I agree with everything else you said. Yeah, and I, I think that um, we are becoming more and more a com complement to each other and from yeah. um, uh, venture debt perspective and the equity perspective. So um, now, probably, and see how Simon, uh, if Simon agrees or disagree, um, founders won't be so shocked when we ask them to provide us with a nuclear scenario on their model yeah. to see how they can extend the cash runway and uh, eventually uh, reach profitability. Because we have experienced uh, sort of material adverse changes yeah. uh, that we cannot, the company cannot control, the investor cannot control, we cannot control. So 
um, uh, would you agree with the approach? So not only focusing, obviously it's important to focus on profitability, but there are other ways to uh, extend the cash runway. And yeah. uh, a bit of a question for you yeah. both, actually. Shall I just have a yeah, go quick go and then I'll hand over if I may. I, I think it's a really good point. And there's two things I would probably raise there is the relationship between uh, an investor, an equity investor, any lender that sits alongside the investor, and obviously the company itself, there needs to be that partnership approach. Because I'm sure the questions, Donatella, that you and I would ask are the same questions that Derek will ask generally about, you know, what do you do in a, in a scenario B situation? And if we look at the world currently, you know, there's so many macro issues that are impacting on, on the globe and on businesses. You don't know where the next one's coming from. So there needs to be some element of a plan on you know, where, where can you improve the unit e economics in a certain scenario. You can't plan for everything, of course, but there's certain situations at a holistic level whereby we should be understanding the cash flow in a bit more detail than probably we've historically done over the last four or five years. Yeah, I think you, you certainly I agree with that. And I think the only thing I would add is certainly having different valves that you could turn on and off, right? Where certainly if, you know, there's a lot of things that we, we can't control uh, from a macro perspective, but should things hit the fan, uh, where are you able to quickly turn off a valve in order to come back to a sustained level of growth, right? And, and maybe for that time period, growth might not be at a rate that you'd like it to, but again, um, coming back to what drops to the bottom line is, is certainly front and center for, for, for us and coming back to that rule of 40 and being able to maintain it um, at, at all costs. And, and of course, in every kind of different scenarios that, that could happen that the business could be hit with. Okay, and uh, actually another question, interesting question I believe sprung to my mind. Um, what about advising the founders on uh, the selection of their investor? Uh, because now we're focusing very much on uh, extend the cash runway, make sure that there is a path to profitability. But then if you don't have the uh, equity investors supporting that path and have enough uh, dry powder to actually be able to provide those CLN where, when are needed, not because uh, you're doing anything wrong, but something uh, they out, outside your uh, control happen, like COVID, like uh, war <laughs> all over the place that is, uh, sadly is upon us. Uh, is that has to be important to select uh, uh, investors with uh, uh, cash and, uh, and a view of uh, follow on? For more sure. More. I, I think for us, that's probably one of the things where we is one of our selling points. When we invest in businesses, we almost reserve as much of our initial equity check, if not double, into our fund. Our first fund here in Europe was 1.3 billion euros, uh, and we only made 17 platform investments with our average day one equity check really only being 45 million euros, and we are able to scale that. Of course, a big chunk of where we scale that initial equity check is going to be going to do buy and builds and driving M&A, but a lot of times during kind of COVID was another example where you know, our founders didn't necessarily need to worry about going out to fundraise as we already had reserved that capital um, in our fund and were able to support through them. So I think it is certainly something to be important. I think in addition as to, I, I think it's what's the value of what the investors truly are gonna bring to you and how does that align with where you wanna go, right? If you're a founder CEO who wants to raise 25 million of primary capital to go put into sales and marketing, PSG is probably not the right investor for you, right? Um, so I think knowing exactly all the different types of investors that exist, um, I feel pretty certain with the number of funds and the amount of dry powder in the market that you will find an investor that's really aligned with your ethos and, and kind of what you're trying to go after. Yeah, yeah to me it was um, not only about the availability of capital, it was also the, the way that these investors uh, behave. Yeah. So it, we do the due diligence both on the debt side and on the equity side on the uh, soon to be portfolio companies. But I think the founders should also do the due diligence on us. Yeah. And see, uh, you know, when everything goes well, like up in the last 10 years, the, you know, um, amazing uh, yeah. stories, availability of capital and so on. So uh, I, I think uh, everybody looked good. 
the important thing is to see uh, how uh, the investors out there uh, behave in situations that are a bit sticky, that are difficult then to yeah. navigate and all of that. Yeah. I, think I think that it would be important for the audience as founders. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I think the track record is extremely important. And, and not everyone has a track record. You know, you have these new emerging managers that have come out of other funds and may have, you know, the, uh, their first fund has, has um, come out in the last kind of two or three years. In probably the most difficult time we've had in, I don't know, 15, 18 years. And, um, you know, what's their track record for that fund? It's, and it's difficult for people, yeah. but um, I think evaluating and understanding how individuals, it goes back to the point I was making about the partnership, how they operate in times of stress and, and uh, difficult situations is really important. And again, the point I made at the beginning is the diligence that the founders undertake in your business is two-way. You should be undertaking the same level of time on the founders, on their track record, on their behaviors, um, on the particular subsectors they follow. So, you know, it's a two-way partnership because ultimately you're probably going to spend, um, and Derek will put me right, right here, I guess, you're probably going to spend as much time with your investors speaking to them weekly as you probably do your family at home. So it's a really, really import, important relationship to get, to get right. And I'd add the debt funders to that as well. Because, yeah, yeah. you know, we yeah, have yeah, to... Yeah, I'm talking we, for yeah, both. Yeah, we yeah, have to demonstrate means. a track record as well and how we behave in, um, yep. in certain times. But, uh, yeah, good point. Derek, you must yeah. agree. <laughs> yeah, <no. laughs> I, I think the other thing I would add to that and probably advice for, for founders is certainly as much as we'd like to make, you know, home run investments every single time, mm. the reality is we've got great performing assets. We've got, you know, lower performing assets within our portfolio. I think one quick thing that you could always do is, is simply ask for an introduction to some of our founders and CEOs, those who are working with us. And yeah. it's not keep that pretty wide open as a question because of course we're going to put our best founders and CEOs in front of you, right? Um, but I think it's specifically asking, you know, give me someone that sits in your top quartile and your bottom quartile so I could speak with both of them, right? How much attention are we still giving our founder and CEOs who are our lowest performing assets in our portfolio? Um, I think will be meaningful, right? Um, and so it, it's certainly something I, I would encourage is, is having these reference calls with the CEOs and founders, particularly if we're invested in a space that you're operating in. Um, how have we been able to be helpful in opening doors and, or, or you know, if it's a business that's not performing as well or according to plan, you know, how do we continue to support them and, and potentially get them over that hump and, and get them back to being a performing asset? Yeah, I, I think it's a great point. The only thing I'd add to that as well is the partnership between any debt provider that may be involved and, and the investor themselves. So when we get into bed you know, with the company and the investor, we have a close relationship with the investor, subject to the, the company allowing that and agreeing it, but it's in everyone's interest for us to be aligned to the investor, to be aligned to what the management's plan is. So having that um, vested joint interest in the outcome or the successful outcome of any business is, is paramount. So, you know, we ensure that we speak with investors before we put money in, into a business. And I'm sure, I don't know, I speak for investors, but I think that's a, a good thing. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I couldn't agree more. So I left the most sticky question for last. <laughs> and uh, we have about five minutes to discuss this. And then I would love to uh, give five minutes to the audience to ask any question that they might have. You better ask a few questions, please. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, my last question is, um, how uh, do you compare, see, predict uh, uh, valuations uh, uh, in the next 12 months in comparison to how it was before? That is a question for you both. OK. I can I'm staying out of it. <laughs> I, I think um, there's two things I'd probably address here is, is probably timing of going out uh, to fundraise. I think one, one thing that's certainly out of our control is, is the macro environment. Um, it, it could get better, it could get worse, um, you know, in the near term and both in the next 12 months. I think certainly are gone are the days of, you know, 2021 valuations, I sound like a broken record saying that, but I, I do think that we will not see those level of valuations come again, uh, at least for myself as an investor, I hope not. Uh, but Me too, <laughs> But the price I, of the warrants. <laughs> I, I think if you've got the strong 
SaaS KPI metrics that we've, we've spent time talking about, and you're ready to go to market, and you know exactly what you're going to use the funds for, and you're a business that's growing you know, 30 plus percent, you're profitable, strong growth in the, uh, retention and net retention, I think you, you become a, a, a rare asset in the market, and there's a scarcity of, of these assets. So I think those assets are still getting relatively premium valuations. Um, there's a lot of investors like ourselves uh, for, as PSG that are kind of have capital to deploy. So it certainly creates the competition for these types of assets. I think if you're an okay business, um, I think you know, that's where we're probably seeing the biggest drop of valuations. And if you're a business that's struggling and burning capital and, and difficult from a gross retention to show product market fit, quite frankly, we're not seeing those assets trade. Um, so I would certainly have, you know, take a step back and rethink as to, um, you know, what the game plan's gonna be in order to get to yourself to a level where you could increase investor appetite. Yeah, I, I agree again. I think for me, um, good management teams and great product or relevant product will get funded, it, to, to your point. I mean, it, it's a given. Um, the valuation question is a very emotive one. You know, I don't own a company, so um, I'm speaking from a from standout perspective looking in. And it is emotional. You know, I, I have a lot of discussions with investors, but also founders and early stage startup businesses and those that are in the high growth area around the valuation as aspect. Um, and it's one that, you, you know, being callous about it, you do need to stand back and you need to value for today. So if your question was around seed funding kind of going in uh, um, early stage. Uh, no, it was more uh, how, um, how the valuation uh, changed yeah. since the last 12 months and yeah. then uh, I'm, I'm going to follow on on, okay. on that. So, so you, know, you need to value for today. And today's valuations are different to those that were 12, 24, 36 months ago. You know, very, very different. Um, you know, the public and private, the public markets tell you first. Um, I think they're around kind of six, seven times now on a kind of SaaS basis. I think private is probably still around, I'm going to say 25 times, but, you know, allow me uh, one or two points either side. But, um, and, and we can look back and we can hang on those valuations of, of 12, 24 months ago. But the reality today is the valuation today is very much different. Um, and it requires a, a, a founder to be very clear about what they're accepting, but to be comfortable with it. Because for the next few years, you're going to have to live with that valuation. And what you don't want to be doing is reflecting on, oh, I got this wrong, I should have got more, because really the focus should be on growing that business. So you, you need to try and find, it's easier said than done, but to find that equilibrium between um, being pushed and not feeling good, but at the end of the day, everyone coming out of it feeling okay, and that's the best result you can get. But as I said, easier said than done when you're a banker and not a founder. So uh, I see people nodding there, so forgive me. Okay, so, uh, and in terms, uh, staying on the valuation subject, um, I personally notice uh, obviously changes on uh, uh, from Series A and to subsequent rounds, uh, this valuation dropping down. Uh, do you, did you see the same on the seed stage? Because my impression is that they're holding the fort there. So what, what is your experience and uh, what, what you're seeing in the market? Um, do you Great. agree? I'll, I'll quickly go and then I'll hand over to Derek. Um, for me, there is a difference, yeah. So we are still seeing a number of of new investments at that stage, that se sorry, seed, series A stage. That's continuing. Um, the valuations, albeit, you know, it's a very core part of the negotiation, um, there seems to be less, there's been a, a reduced reduction, oh, sorry, a reduced level in valuation around there because it's not as relevant as a high growth where the valuation is very near term and is going to have a, a, a major impact. So at the kind of seed stage, series A, it's a factor and you can get to a point, but you've then got a period of time to really drive and deliver the business to achieve the valuation that you think your business should be in the future. So whilst it's really important, the valuation, it's not as relevant as maybe a kind of later stage mm. business mm. at this particular moment yeah. in time. 
Okay, so I think we should leave the last word on this uh, to an equity investor, to Derek. Yeah. So what is your feel, what you're seeing yeah, in the market? Yeah. Do you believe I, I that's I, right yeah, or I not? would circle back to what I mentioned earlier. I mean, we, we recently just looked at a business that, again, put numbers to it, 12 million ARR, 40% growth, 35% cash EBITDA business. I think that's, you know, rule of 75, um, that's a business that ultimately traded at 12 times ARR. If it's a business that, you know, you're kind of sub rule of 40, I think that's where we're probably seeing the biggest shift in valuations. I think those are no longer getting double digit ARR multiples. Um, and that is certainly coming down to anywhere between six to eight times ARR, I would say is probably what market is valuing these businesses at. Um, and I think if you're, you know, rule of negative, I think that's where you'll, you'll struggle to even get a deal done in this market. Okay, so to leave the audience before we dive into a few questions, uh, um, shall we summarize uh, our uh, lovely, uh, important topic uh, of today with, uh, I would say, uh, first and foremost, uh, focus on the unit economics, uh, clarity, I would say, and then uh, transparency between uh, founders and uh, um, investors and uh, what else would you add? Path to profitability. You and know, path to profitability, of course. Okay, shall we uh, ask if there are any questions in the audience, please? Hi. Uh, Hi. There's been a talk but here. Tell, tell us about you. Oh, I'm. Ah, introduce yourself. Uh, from House Space. Okay, uh, nice to meet you. Collaboration platform. Um, there's been a talk about demand for more flexible subscription models here as well. So not just pure ARR, but more also usage-based models. Uh, how do you see that in terms of valuation? Uh, you know, I think for a while it's been like the valuation is, you know, only thing that matters is the ARR. But do you see any shift in there? As Simon and I's don't price, I think, is a question yeah, for you, Derek. You, <laughs> with, this, with you, Derek, this one. For sure. Um, I think it really depends what the, obviously, there's going to be the ARR, pure subscription element of the business, which I think will take your traditional valuation path. I think other elements that we're seeing in the market, um, I think it, it depends on the predictability of that revenue stream, right? Could we consider it a reoccurring, right? Is it transactional volume where it's, it's predictable if someone's sitting on a, on a SaaS platform and then you know, they're overlaying payments. I think where it becomes a little tricky and there we could probably get a pretty close to you know, a relatively entreated as recurring because there's that predictability level and we could see that in customer cohorts and, and how they're, 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 they're spending over time. I think where it becomes a little difficult where we'll start implementing a kind of sum of parts valuation methodology is, you know, is it a services where you know, it's, it's headcount heavy where you need the actual people and then two, if it's a, you know, reselling a hardware component, right? I think that's where you're certainly not going to get the same multiple that's going to be, you know, put and assigned to those different revenue streams. I think ultimately, if you wanted a, a key metric to look at, I would say, what's the gross margin of every single individual uh, revenue stream? And, and that's kind of really how, you know, we'll be able to, to put a, a, a multiple on those different revenue streams. Okay. But I think we're relatively flexible, and I think we've certainly started to look a little more and more at tech-enabled services businesses, you know, but again, you know, how core is that technology to deliver the service versus is it a service with a piece of technology? Those are two very different things, um, and I think one will define how reoccurring that services piece is, because that technology is instrumental to the service that's being delivered. Thank you, Derek. There is, I have one more minute. <laughs> so can we have one more question? And maybe uh, anything uh, um, around that, venture debt for Simon, uh, on any other question? Yes, please. I wanted to ask to Donatella that here sometimes women... I'm the moderator. <laughs> oh, okay. Jesus, can yes, I ask no, you? No, no, the reason is because we always want to have more women. Now you can, no, I was um, I, just, just from your own experience, sure. or even to then. So um, is there any possibility that you explain, if you hear from any initiatives where there is, I suppose, 
um, I suppose, a more involvement of women in the processes. And the reason I'm saying this is because many times we go to these events and we think that sometimes we need more women participation. So from my point of view, sometimes it's difficult for various reasons. So my question to you, have you come across any experiences in your life and your past where you could say, okay, I believe that this particular fundraise or whatever, were the women more I suppose more represented, that's maybe my question, but representation in terms of having more, having access to whatever fundraise or whatever uh, VC is this about. But you, we're talking from a point of view of, uh, of yeah. uh, me yeah, investing yeah. in uh, yeah, startups yeah. with yeah. Uh, women representation. Yeah, because sometimes in, well, Ireland, in yeah. Ireland it's difficult, we, we are part of this um, women in tech group and sometimes we think oh my God, we, we feel that there is not enough representation of women getting funding, especially if you're a startup. So my question for you from well, your experiences. I am uh, I, I'm after the time is up, so let me uh, answer very quickly. So I'm very proud to say that one, uh, we have uh, one CEO, one of my portfolio companies, female. Uh, we have one uh, amazing CFO is also female of one of our portfolio companies. And I'm sure that my colleagues here on the panel are also um, looking into female representation closely and closely. But one thing that I personally believe we need to really always bear in mind is uh, who is the best candidate? Who is the best person to back? Because we don't want to decrease, uh, and this is said from a woman point of view, we don't want to decrease quality because we are after uh, diversity. Diversity has to be uh, addressed, but also has to be the best person for, for the job, for uh, building the best uh, startups and all of that. Uh, I agree with you. I'm, I'm an advocate to the, for diversity and more women in the ecosystem, but not for the sake of it, for the, if, for the value of it. Who is the, who is the best, essentially, right? Yeah, right. opportunity. The, yeah. me, it's been given the opportunity right across the board and um, you, you know from what I'm seeing there's, there's a big push in, in this area you know certainly from an HSBC innovation banking perspective we uh, push the gender issue just just generally the uh, you know right across the board in terms of diversity not just gender yeah yeah um, but it's a really important fact. But it should and I totally be addressed earlier. It should be addressed from uh, from uh, education and, uh, and yeah. push uh, push women more in, uh, in universities uh, goes off the topic, but I think it's very important. Push, uh, uh, not push, allow women to actually uh, go more on certain path that would allow them to become most likely to become a founder. So all of this should be addressed from very early on. Yes, <laughs> we're done. <laughs> well, thank you, everyone. Thank you.